It's fascinating how we come into the world so clumsy and naive and then develop into these complicated beings who can understand how things work all around us in both concrete and abstract terms. Let's talk about a book that explores this amazing evolution. How we learn the new science of education and the brain by Stanislas Dehin. Uh oh. Stanislas Dehany. <laughs> no. Stanislas Dehin. Stanislas Dehen. Stanislas Dehen. <laughs> this book was born from the author's fascination with what he calls the greatest talent of the human brain the ability to learn. And as a world-famous neuroscientist, he should know a thing or two about the brain. Human learning appeared as an evolutionary necessity. Our DNA contains the equivalent of about 750 megabytes of information, while our brains can hold up to 100 terabytes of information. So we come into the world with pre-existing knowledge that can fit onto an old CD-ROM, and the rest of our knowledge is gained through learning. It's almost like having the blueprints of how to acquire and organize information while we draw and process said information from our external environment. Learning helps all living organisms adapt to their environment as well and as quickly as possible. However, out of all living species, humans stand out through our ability to teach ourselves intentionally. At its current stage, artificial intelligence is only able to mimic a small part of how our brain functions, and our brains are still a lot better at learning than any machine. To learn is to form an internal model of the external world. The first chapter draws parallels between seven key ideas that lie at the foundation of machine learning algorithms and how our brain learns. Now, imagine for a second you start playing a new action-adventure video game, and let's look at how these key ideas about learning apply. One of the first things you'll do is break down problems by creating hierarchical models, such as learning the basic game controls and using them consciously until they come naturally. You'll also try to minimize errors by attempting different strategies when you reach that first truly difficult mission, which you can't complete on the first attempt. For example, if you just walk into enemy territory guns blazing and don't get too far, you'll try the stealth approach on the next attempt. Learning is also about exploring multiple possibilities and inserting random data into the possible solutions to a problem. That's why you pursue side quests. Or maybe you're wondering what happens when you drive a vehicle into a river. As a side note, I'm pretty sure pineapple pizza results from such a learning experiment. Another key point is that we must include optimized rewards that reinforce learning. This part is on the game developers. If the game is insanely hard or too easy, you, like most other players, will quickly lose interest. That's why games give you the option to level up your character, buy houses or vehicles, and unlock interesting perks when you complete story missions. Since there's so much information out there, you must keep your search space focused on what's relevant. This is especially true if we're talking about an open-world adventure game. If your goal is to complete a mission that unfolds on the north side of the game map, you won't achieve anything by exploring the south side. Finally, learning means creating a knowledge foundation by which we can generalize what we learn in one place and apply it to others. If you become proficient at playing GTA V, your learning curve for playing other similar games like Red Dead Redemption 2 or Mafia 3 won't be so steep. For those of you concerned with artificial intelligence helping machines overtake humans, Stanislas Dehan has an optimistic message. Machines are still very limited when compared to the human brains. We have the edge when prioritizing information for extracting general principles. Artificial intelligence can't learn abstract concepts. A recent study showed that Face ID algorithms have trouble processing aging. Their ability to recognize faces decreases five years after receiving the initial data, while most of us don't have any trouble recognizing our former classmates at our 20th high school reunion. We're also unique in our ability to share information voluntarily, something we call social learning, and our capacity to integrate new information into a network of existing knowledge. When we learn a new skill, it's immediately available to help us achieve our goals. Kind of like how I learned to properly pronounce the author's name at the beginning of this video. Stanislas Dehen. Stanislas Dehen. We recombine our skills to solve new problems, something AI can't do yet, and we understand meta rules that apply to various circumstances. Most importantly, we can draw a maximum amount of information from each observation. We act as statisticians, thinking about how likely or unlikely something is. Our brain learns by adjusting many models of the world to the way we perceive reality. A newborn's brain already has considerable knowledge thanks to our race's long evolutionary history. 
Before my son could even crawl, he seemed to have a good grasp of the laws of physics. He knew that inanimate objects don't just move by themselves, and he was very surprised when I brought home his first remote-controlled car. Well, uh, surprised isn't probably the best way to describe 30 minutes of inconsolable crying, but anyway. Many studies have shown that babies like to experiment. They have a sense of numbers and an intuition for probabilities. Most notably, babies have some sort of language instinct. They obviously don't come into the world with a lexicon, but they can acquire words and the rules for using them in coherent sentences in record time. This is because most of the neural structures of an adult brain already exist in that of a newborn baby. Babies learn to speak so quickly because their brains are pre-wired to detect sounds, words and sentences. They also have a keen sense of space, being able to orient themselves in a room as soon as they can crawl. While nature contributes by shaping the brain's structure, our experiences refine and enrich how our brain is organized. At its foundational level, our brains are made up of distinct brain cells called neurons, which communicate with each other through synapses. These synapses constantly change as we gain new knowledge. We create memories by encoding and remembering information. Our brain processes new information and assigns labels, then groups it with similar items that we have learned in the past. Each time we perceive an event, our emotional systems decide whether or not it's important enough to be remembered. If the answer is yes, the connections between the set of neurons involved in processing that information will remain dormant and they will increase in strength each time we recall it. There is a popular analogy that says our brains store information just like a computer's hard drive. That's not entirely accurate. Information from a hard drive is retrieved in its initial form, while each restored memory of ours is in fact a reconstruction of the initial neural connection. We don't just retrieve information, we also reconstruct it, and other neural connections can interfere. We commonly misremember seeing or talking to specific people we know at events they never attended, just because it's the type of event they'd normally attend. There isn't just one region of the brain that handles memory. It seems that memories are stored everywhere. There are four different types of memory. Working memory keeps neurons in an active state in the areas of the brain dedicated to cognitive control functions. It's also called short-term memory, because it can only last for a few seconds. Episodic memory encodes the context of each recent event, where, when, how and with whom things happened, and then stores all of this information together with other recent memories in a section of the brain called the hippocampus. Semantic memory is what happens after memories move from the hippocampus to a new location within the brain's cortex after being categorized during sleep. At this point, they become permanent knowledge. Finally, procedural memory is the unconscious recording of patterns of routine activity. Through repetition, information starts flowing better until performing certain actions becomes nearly effortless. To learn best, our brains require a balanced diet, oxygenation and physical exercise. The brain has significant plasticity that allows it to self-organize, but this plasticity decreases with age and learning becomes increasingly difficult as we grow older. Then brings forth one of his own hypotheses, which he calls neural recycling. While the brain's plasticity makes it malleable to the point where our brains physically grow as we learn, there are still anatomical constraints that keep us from turning into megamind. When we invent a new cultural element, such as mathematics or language, the brain recycles circuits assigned to other functions. For example, reading recycles the circuits of vision and spoken language. And yes, that means people who are more adept at reading respond less intensely to visual cues such as faces. In the end, both sides of the nature-nurture debate are partially correct. At birth, children are equipped with pre-existing structures for organizing knowledge, resulting from millions of years of evolution. But babies' brains also come equipped with powerful learning algorithms that make them incredibly efficient at learning useful things. Brain plasticity, by itself, can't account for the success of our species. We also need to acknowledge the contribution of four main functions of our brain. Attention, active engagement, error feedback, and consolidation. In the end's opinion, these functions constitute the four pillars of learning. Let's start with attention. A simple way to describe it is as a series of mechanisms by which the brain selects and processes information. There are three major attention systems. Alerting mobilizes our brains whenever there is a potential danger. It tells us when we need to pay attention. Orienting tells us what to attend to and keeps us focused on items of interest while at the same time filtering out what we need to ignore. 
Finally, executive control decides how we process information that we attend to. It's closely connected to our working memory. This system is only able to process one item at a time, which is why we can't really multitask. Executive control is the equivalent of willpower or self-control. We get better at it during the first two decades of our lives, when it's continuously improving. So don't ever expect a five-year-old to exercise executive control the same way an adult can. A significant part of human attention depends on social signals. We're equipped with an active mode of learning, in which we create hypotheses that we test, and a receptive mode, in which we are influenced by the actions and words of other people. We must find a compromise between these two modes, as relying too heavily on either could be counterproductive. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to question the beliefs of our groups. Learning doesn't just happen, it takes work. This makes me think of a popular cartoon scene from back when I was a kid. The show's called Dexter's Laboratory, and it's about a boy genius who invents a machine that puts knowledge into your head while you sleep at night. He tried using it for his French test, but he got unexpected results. I'll link the video in the comment section, it's pretty funny and worth a watch. The thing is, learning doesn't work like that. If only it would. We learn little or nothing if we're not actively engaging with our environment, generating theories and then testing the validity of those theories. That's why motivation is essential to the learning process. We only learn if we have a clear goal that we're committed to. Motivation keeps us engaged in achieving that goal. We should also distinguish between superficial learning and learning for meaning. Now, I don't know how many people have this problem, but I'm really bad at remembering dates, including birthdays and anniversaries. At some point, a friend of mine described herself as being a crab with a lion's tail, because she was born the night between the Cancer and Leo zodiac signs. I still can't remember the exact date, but it's really easy for me to look it up based on this information. To better remember a concept, you need to understand its associated meaning. Learners need to be active, but they also need guidance for learning to be effective. A theory of learning called classical constructivism postulates that children should be left to discover the world independently, with no external guidance. But hundreds of years of testing this theory, which was very popular during the years of the French Revolution, have proven its ineffectiveness. Active engagement is driven by curiosity, a force that pushes us to act the same way hunger pushes us to seek out food. Satisfying curiosity activates our dopamine circuit, putting it up there with other pleasureful activities such as shopping and eating chocolate. Curiosity is generated when we notice a gap between what we know and what we want to know. We're not curious about things we've seen or heard a hundred times before, nor about new information that's too complex or novel. Our desire to learn must be associated with a reward, and information acquisition can be just that, under the right circumstances. We don't always get things right on our first attempt which is a perfectly acceptable outcome in a learning process. We get feedback from our environment or from someone who's guiding us. When you're learning to bake a chocolate cake and it comes out all burned and crispy, you either forgot to rotate the pan halfway through baking or you forgot to preheat the oven. Or maybe it's something else you're not even aware of. The feedback from the environment comes in the form of a burnt, inedible cake. If you try to figure it out on your own, it could take a couple more failed attempts till you get there. But if you're a student in a cooking class, the instructor might give you accurate feedback that will speed up your learning process. However, if the instructor only grades your performance without providing suggestions for improvement, that's not effective or constructive feedback. And unfortunately, most educational systems are based on punishment and grading, which are useless for learning unless accompanied by constructive assessments. Grades can cause stress and anxiety that diminish our ability to learn. On the other hand, frequent testing is great for learning, if the correct answers are provided at the end of each test. We learn best by surprise, and the spacing of learning sessions is one of the most effective strategies for making information stick. When we distribute learning over several days, our memory is three times more effective in retaining information than when we try to learn everything at once. After they learn the alphabet, it takes about three years for children to read entire words rather than read them one letter at a time. This is the perfect example of how we move from slow, effortful processing of information to fast, nearly automatic expertise. Another example is driving. We're exhausted after our first few driving sessions, but if we keep at it, it becomes second nature. Consolidation is the process of automating tasks and freeing up brain resources for other purposes. This is something that happens every night. 
while we sleep, our brain consolidates what it learned the previous day. That's why it is more effective to learn in the late evening than in the early morning. Sleeping prevents forgetting, and not only in the sense of consolidating existing knowledge. Discoveries from the previous day are also recorded in an abstract form that can potentially modify pre-existing mental models. Over the past century, psychology, neurology, and education sciences uncovered a lot about how our brain works. However, much of this knowledge remains to be implemented in educational practices, and some unproven myths about education still linger today. The author wraps up the book with a list of 13 takeaway messages to optimize children's potential as a summary of the concepts discussed in the book. This wraps up the summary of How We Learn, the new science of education and the brain. Thanks for watching and happy learning!